This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi, I'm Dr. Deepak Meghur and today is yet another very interesting case of a lens-induced phacomorphic glaucoma in an elderly lady. She presented a few days back and we started on treatment with IV mannitol and all anti-glaucoma medications and anti-inflammatory drugs like topical steroids. In spite of all the medications, three days later her pressure continued to be a 50 millimeters of mercury and this was the day wherein the surgery was planned. So medications alone had not reduced the pressure significantly so we thought we'd go ahead with the surgery. After mannitol, the pressure has come down to around 30 millimeters. The slit temp examination we can see that there is a diffuse haze in the cornea and she has got a profusely thick arcus senilis. The antechamber is extremely shallow. It's in fact less than 2 mm as recorded by the biometer. So I've got multiple challenges, a very elderly patient, unhealthy cornea, intumescent lens, a lot of inflammation and extremely shallow chamber. And let's see how we get across this case. The surgery is being done under post-resubtenance anesthesia. After staining the anti-capsule, I'm injecting dispersive OVD into the eye to deepen the chamber. The main incision is created. The plan is to perform a two-stage rexus. Using the Haldipuka forceps, I'm performing the initial small primary rexus. The lens is extremely tense, so I want to get around 2 to 3 mm small rexus. A few modifications to note. I have not introduced the second instrument to the side port to stabilize the globe. Instead, I am using Hoskins forceps to stabilize the globe by holding the sclera at the limbus. Since the chamber is extremely shallow, I don't want a second instrument to be entered into the eye. As soon as I puncture the capsule, there is a hint of the capsule getting extended, but luckily it just stays there. And to begin with, I am using more of a tearing technique where the capsular flap is held flat. I am just trying to tear it in a circle. Once I get some confidence that I am in control of the situation, then I fold the capsule and continue the small rexus using the shearing technique. And now is the time to decompress the bag. Another additional problem which I have in this case is the eyes are extremely deeply set. That's the socket is very deep and there's a lot of accumulation of fluid. So I've arranged for a suction apparatus so that it takes care of the pooling of the fluid here. I'm using the bimanual IA system to decompress the bag. It's important for us to remember that the anti-capsule will be very fragile. So when you're trying to manipulate the cortex out of the bag, from the fornices of the capsular bag and behind the nucleus, we can subconsciously try to stretch the rexus margin and it can tear. So we need to be extremely careful and conscious about this fact. So just trying to aspirate the cortex, just nudge at the nucleus, try to tilt a little bit, tip on it, uh, try to rotate it so that the cortex gets loosened up and then you can aspirate the loose cortex. It's very tempting to go with the aspiration port right through the capsule bag through the fornices but we may end up stretching at the rexus margin and I've had instances where the rexus margin has torn during these maneuvers because these eyes are extremely sick and the capsule would be very fragile. Any sort of stretching can tear it. So this is a fact which we need to be very conscious about. I think patience does play a great role in managing this because you just have to patient keep on tapping at the nucleus and all of the cortex eventually comes out and you can substantially decompress the bag. I'm going in with my irrigation probe alone through the main incision and trying to just irrigate out some of the loose cortex. This also helps to just tap the lens and ensure that some of the cortex which could be free can just flow out. It's important that when you're trying to do this maneuver, the posterior lip of the main incision is pressed down so that we avoid any building up of pressure. So this is one step which we need to be careful and once I am certain that enough decompression has been achieved, now I proceed to enlarge your axis. Tangential cut using a micro scissors is given and 
a secondary large rexis measuring about 5 mm is successfully created. Time to deal with the nucleus. The visibility is not great because of the corneal health as well as there is little space. The lens is very bulky. There is a shallow antechamber although it has now significantly deepened because of the decompression of the bag. But these are some of the things which are going in my head. Luckily the rexis size is adequate enough. The typical strategy for me to deal with such a lens is usually I create a small central trench initially and then start to perform the vertical chop. As I'm performing this vertical chop maneuvers, I want you all to please keep an eye at the incision because there is something interesting is going to occur there. So I'm continuing with my chopping maneuvers. The nucleus is really not so dense. It's so not at all difficult in dividing the nucleus. The vertical chopping maneuver is quite efficient in dividing these nucleus into multiple small fragments. I decide to emulsify each of these fragments. I pull them out of the bag. I am trying to emulsify at the level of the pupil. At this point, you can just note here that there is a sort of a flap which is fluttering at the incision. Well, this is the desmers membrane which is torn there and it is threatening to come away. At this point, during surgery, I had not noticed this still. As the next few fragments are getting emulsified, this fluttering flap grabs my attention. So now I am very conscious that this case can end up having a large desmond detachment especially if you try to come out or go in again the irrigating fluid through the sleeve can get in and cause a massive detachment as well. But luckily it is torn at both these edges so the fluid unlikely to get in through the lamellar space and cause a massive lamellar detachment but definitely this tongue shaped detachment is at risk of getting extended. So I have noticed this now so what are the changes I do now is the first thing was I don't want to get the phaco tip with the sleeve very close to the wound. I want to work always staying stationary and ensuring that the sleeve holes are much more anterior to the torn edge of the desmets membrane. Usually after emulsifying uh, for the first heminucleus in such compromised corneas I would always come out and prefer to put in more viscoelastic but that would carry a certain amount of risk here so I decided to continue emulsifying the remaining fragments uh, without any replenishing of the OVD. The one important thing which I am doing is I am not moving my phaco tip at all it is just held stationary. And I'm conscious that I don't get the tip very much near the wound because in that case the fluid from the sleeve is going to irrigate the tear and the tear is going to get dislodged. Even some amount of mechanical movement to and fro of the tip itself can strip out some more amount of desmets membrane. So this is very, I'm very conscious about it. So all my maneuvers are extremely limited with the phaco tip. I could say that the, I'm just focusing on keeping the phaco tip extremely stationary and only the, my left chopper is moving around and trying to feed the fragments into the phaco tip. So I was quite anxious until the last piece was emulsified because one I was always fixated at this and I was extremely relieved when the last piece was emulsified and I carefully come out. Once I come out, I can see that the desmet membrane tongue shaped detachment which was there has fallen back again. I'm introducing a cannula through the main incision itself to flush that the posterior capsule which is a habit for me. But when I'm introducing, I'm careful that the cannula is directed much more posterior so that it doesn't get entangled into the torn desmet membrane. The best idea would be just to avoid it altogether. I'm also uh, introducing OVD again, viscoelastic. Uh, while introducing the cannula is just pressed down on the floor of the tunnel and then goes inside again to ensure that we the cannula doesn't get entangled into the tone desmets membrane. 
the other best alternative would be to use a side port to put the ovd rather than using the main incision cortex aspiration is done using the bimanual ind through the side port so it is relatively very safe because the main incision is not at all encroached upon no time to implant the intraocular lens typically i use the hydro implantation to implant these single piece lenses but in this case because of this complexity of a tone small desmond membrane detachment i am pushing in ovd through the side port i am using sodium hyaluronate so that a space is created in the bag and also the eyeball is relatively tight and it is not soft so that the cartridge when it moves into the incision doesn't strip off the desmond membrane another step where in the desmond membrane detachment can extend is when it gets entangled with the cartridge so i am inflating the bag adequately making it very tight so that the desmond membrane is very well opposed to the stroma as the cartridge goes in the lens is implanted into the bag i think the strategy of you know pressurizing the eye with viscoelastic has helped to keep the tone flap of the desmond membrane in place the ovd both in front and behind the lens is aspirated out It looks like the desmond membrane tear is really holding on well it is attached the side ports are hydrated i'm reluctant to hydrate the main incision but as i try to do it i'm conscious not to inject it posteriorly i'm trying to include the anterior stroma but i can see this fluttering flap still there so that's it the case is done and eventually i thought the i was successful in preventing the extension of the desmond membrane detachment in these elderly patients who have got uh, these uh, thick arcus it has been my observation that some of these patients are more vulnerable to develop these desmond membrane detachments because i feel the attachment of the desmond membrane to the stroma is extremely loose in a very specific set of eyes so we need to be very watchful and careful and take all the necessary precautions that's it thank you for watching and hope you found this helpful